And so we'll be in Acts 42, starting at verse 52, and I'm going to just start reading, amen. It's just so good to be in the house of the Lord, amen. I just, I just bless the Lord for it. Hallelujah. And so I'm going to be reading from the um, SHV, and so it, it might be a little different on, on some of the words, but not the word, all right? So look at 42. And when the Hebrews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Hebrews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of Yah. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of Yah. But when the Hebrews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of Yah should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so had Yahweh commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of Yahweh. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, and the word of Yahweh was published throughout all the region. Father, we thank you for your word. It is truly, hallelujah, it is truly a blessing to read. It is health, God, hallelujah, to our body, it's marrow to our bones. It's sweeter than the honeycomb, God. We love your word, God, and we just thank you for your word, for speaking to us. And we pray that we would do your word justice this morning and that we would walk worthy of our vocation and that you would bless us with much revelation and illumination. God, here in Lafayette and all over America as our online church listens, in Yahshua Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Saints of God, we've been studying in Acts 13, just kind of looking at Paul preaching in Antioch Presidia. And as Paul was preaching, a God, we saw that the Gentiles besought, a God, Paul and Barnabas to preach that word to them again. And we told you why it was their season. It was a switching of dispensation. We had two groups of people that were there, but one group was real sensitive to the move of God. And it was because God was calling the Gentiles, a God, unto himself. We saw that Paul and Barnabas just persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Never let go of the cross. Never leave the gospel, a God. Always be cross-centered. You could know who you are. That's fine. But it don't change the need, the necessity of us to be blood-bought and redeemed by the cross of Calvary. Come on, give y'all some glory. Amen. We saw as Paul, a God, was, was preaching that the whole city came out. These, these Gentiles, they began to fill up the synagogue. They were in the doorways, in the windows, a God, in the atriums, in the, 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 the courtyards. They, the whole city, almost the whole city came out to hear this word. And, and when it's your season, you're hungry for the presence of God, hungry for the word of God. And that's what it was with the Gentiles. And we are praying prophetically that this same Independent operation is happening to the Hebrews all over the world. And we're seeing that as we travel. We see a Hebrew people, while everybody else is falling away, we are seeing a people that's attempting to get closer to God, to hear his word. Amen. And I'm talking about all Hebrews, not just the blacks. I'm talking about the Latinos. I'm talking about all of us. We all trying to press our way, it got into the presence of the most high God. And so we saw as this revival was taking place that the Hebrews were filled with envy. The Hebrews that were still on the old covenant and the old way and the old disposition, they were filled with envy because they were doing things the old way, the last word that they got from God. But how many people know that God will do a new thing in your midst? Anybody hear me up in here? He'll do a whole brand new thing, and that's why you got to be led. Somebody say, come on, tell your neighbor you got to be led. 
got to be led. Because when God will switch directions, a God, and it's all in the confinements of his word, when he switched directions, you could be lost. You could be left behind because God will do a new thing on you. He will. When Yahshua came, that was a new thing. When he switched the gospel to be Gentile sinner, that was a new thing. And I'm telling you, when he's switching it back to the Hebrews, guess what that is? That's a new thing. So you're going to have to be led. You're going to have to hear him. And if you can't hear him as well as others, you better get with some people that can hear him. Come on, look at your other neighbor and say, how's your hearing this morning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to be able to hear. All right, because God will do a new thing. And I don't mean in the physical. Don't laugh at people with hearing need next to you. I'm, I'm just saying. You see what I'm saying? How's your spiritual hearing this morning? You see what I'm saying? And so you got to be ready. You got to be ready. So this, this revival began to happen. But, but the Hebrews, instead of jumping on the new thing, they became, they became envious. And we talked about that, just full of envy. Instead of going the new direction God was going, they began to talk about Paul and Barnabas and say, why are y'all going over there? They began to contradict everything Paul and Barnabas said. They began to challenge everything Paul and Barnabas said, blaspheme everything Paul and Barnabas said. And it was blasphemy because the thing wasn't from Paul and Barnabas. The thing was from God. And so we saw last time that Paul and Barnabas waxed bold, y'all. They say it was necessary. It was necessary that we would go to you first, the Hebrews. He said, but lo, seeing that you put it from you, that you reject the word. We got to understand something about God. God going to reach out his hand to you, yeah, but he going to only reach it out for so long. Oh, no. God said in his word in Genesis, he says, his spirit shall not always strive with men. He's not going to sit there while you reject him and you reject his word and you reject his way and you reject his new move and his new direction. He's not going to sit there and just wait forever for you. God's going to move on. And that's what happened, A God, with the Hebrews in our scripture in the book of Acts. Paul says, seeing you put it from you, he said, low. Somebody say low. Not high, low. Low. We turn to the Gentiles. One of the saddest things for our people to ever hear spoken in the scriptures. It was like the spirit of God went Ichabod upon our house and upon our people. And the spirit of grace and blessing and favor and revival and salvation went to the Gentiles. And it invoked a time, a time that we are in right now called the times of the Gentiles. It's a time where the grace of God is with them, that everything they do works, and everything they, they play, they win. Everything is just, it's just the blessing of God. And that's been that way since this time and acts up until this present time right now. That's why the nations that they establish are established by the grace of God. America, America, God shed his grace upon thee. You see what I'm saying? But we find ourselves in a second disposition, dispensation happening right now. Because God said that he would not forsake his people Israel forever. And that's the good news, huh? Some good news. That our God is a God of a what? Second chance. <laughs> and the favor that we lost, the glory that we lost, the glory that we once had with the Father, that glory is returning in our days, in our lifetime. And we are transitioning from the times of the Gentiles back to the times of the Hebrews times of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the times of David, the times of Solomon, Hezekiah, the times of Jehoshaphat. And I know some of you can't see it, but that's all right. And some of you can't hear it, and that's okay too. But just trust, if you've got a little hearing problem, that God is going to always place somebody around you that can hear and see a little bit better than you. Anybody hear me up in here? All right? That's how he does. That's how he does. That's the office of the prophet. That's the office of the prophet. Isaiah could see a little bit better than the people. Ezekiel could see a little bit better than the people. Moses could see a little bit better than the people. Joshua could see a little bit better than the people. You see? You see? Look at your neighbor and say, how's your hearing this morning? We saw last time, amen, that God had sent us to be a light to the Gentiles. And that's why we stopped last time, if you remember. 
we looked at like three sub points the Lord commanded us. And we looked at it like, like a personal call for Paul. Because as we go back to Paul's salvation experience, it was always God's purpose when he called Paul. As Paul would say in his Pauline epistles, he said, when my mother, when, when God separated me from my mother's womb, put this gospel in me. It was always God's purpose for Paul to be a God, a, 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 mm, a catalyst for this dispens dispensation switch, that Paul would be the apostle of the Gentiles, that he would be the one that God would use, a God, to take this thing and to save the Gentiles. Paul says God commanded us. God commanded Paul to preach this thing to the Gentiles. That was his call. And we just challenge you to make sure you find your calling. Make sure you know why God called you and what he called you to. We just find ourselves questioning somebody else's calling when we don't even know our own. How in the world are you going to know whether somebody doing their calling when you don't know your calling? What kind of sense does that make? Look at your neighbor and ask him, what's your calling? Look at your other neighbor and say, don't judge nobody, Colin. You don't even know yours. A Mother's Day message. Mother's Day message is coming. Y'all know how I do it. By the grace of God. So... We saw that the Lord commanded us was a personal thing, but, but not only personal purpose, but set thee a light to the Gentiles. We also have purpose as a people. You have an individual purpose, but we also have a purpose as a people. And we saw that our purpose as a people was to shine a light in this dark age that we live in. And I showed you eschatology, a God, in Revelations that we always knew that the Hebrews in the last days, during the fall in the way, that the Jews, that's what we thought, the Hebrews would be the final witness of God in the last days. Lynn, we just didn't know it was us. And it was all right with our theology when it wasn't us. Yeah, they're going to be the two witnesses. They're going to be the ones that's going to be the seal, 12,000, 12,000. They're going to be one. But then we find out we the people. And somehow now eschatology don't matter. Oh, it don't matter if you the people. But it mattered when they was the people. Now it don't matter when we the people. Man, that's reverse racism. You a new fool. You mad at yourself. You hate yourself. You loved it more when they was the people. You loved it more when you believed the lie. You loved it more when God said that their hair was like wool and their feet was like brass, but you loved it more when their eyes were blue, when their hair was fine and their lips were skinny. You loved the lie more than the truth. You loved the lie more than the truth. And now you done found out the truth and you mad about that? And now you're going to say it don't matter? You hate yourself, dog. You hate yourself. You one of the ones, when you were young, you look in the mirror, wish you was like them other people. And in some degree, you still look in the mirror and you wish. When you going to be fine with the way the Lord made you? Woo! Happy Mother's Day. This is just the introduction. This is just the introduction. Come on, now, ain't no greater present mama than to cut you up on Mother's Day. Leave that bleeding. You look good, but you're bleeding in the spirit. The Lord commanded us, gave us a personal purpose, set the light to the Gentiles, a, a people purpose that we would go out and spread salvation to the ends of the earth, gave us a gospel message. In these last days, we're going to have to be cross-centered, gospel-oriented. It don't matter about we the people in regards to the gospel now. We've got to preach that thing. We, don't, we will be the only voice 
the only voice on earth. As these people let go of God, as they cutting their grass, they jogging this morning, and they not in the house of God, we going to be the only ones. God going to shout from the heavens, who going to go for us? And we will stand up, hallelujah, in these last days, not like we did in our former. We're going to stand up in these last days. We're going to say, we ready now. We will go for you, God. We will go for you, God. We're going to carry the mantle that we was always supposed to carry. We will bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And that's going to be our calling in these last days. So let's look at our point that we have before us this morning. And I guess it's around the seventh point in this series that we just breaking up these scriptures. We want to look at this whole thing where Paul says that uh, Luke says in the book of Acts that they were ordained to eternal life. And I'm hoping that I can get to it because there's so much meat on the way there. Hey, God, if we get that fine, if we don't, we'll just come. God spare life uh, next Sunday and deal with that. Um, but I'm going to kind of divide this, 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 this point into three sub-points. Um, the Gentiles were glad. Um, I'll share it with you when we get to it. But we're going we gonna to talk about like three sub-points, A, B, and C. And hopefully we can, we can get to C. So let's look at verse 48 of Acts 13. For verse 48. It tells us, and when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed the Bible begins with the word hallelujah uh, Gentiles and when the Gentiles heard this now let's define this for a second when we look at the word Gentiles in the Greek it means a foreigner it means a strange or a stranger uh, it means something that's unfamiliar uh, alien, something that's distant. Huh? Somebody say Gentile. Gentile. All right, and so it says, and when the Gentiles, now we know who they are, they're the foreigners, they're the ones that's distant, and we talk about distant from God, they're the ones that's kind of strange or strangers. The Bible says, and when the Gentiles heard this, and let's focus on the word this for a second. All right, what did the Gentiles hear? Huh? They heard Paul and Barnabas. What did Paul and Barnabas say? They say, the Lord commanded us to go to the Gentiles. The Lord has set the Hebrews to be a light to the Gentiles. The Lord wants to make sure that the Hebrews bring salvation. Where? Unto the ends of the earth, to the Gentiles. And so when the Gentiles heard this, that statement, just breaking it down, huh? cutting it up for you, fine, so you can see where we at. When the Gentiles heard Paul say this, the Bible says they were glad. They were glad. And that word glad, as we kind of hallelujah sparse that up, means to be full of joy. It means to be happy and cheerful. We'll see it in our Bible translated as rejoice. Hey, God. Y'all remember Brian's song, Rejoice with Me? <laughs> Come and sing handsome to the Lord. Because he's been so good. All right. That little, that little song make me dance any, every time I hear it. Somebody say rejoice with me. The Bible says the Gentiles were glad. They rejoiced when they heard that Paul said the Lord commanded us to go to the Gentiles. He set us as a light to the Gentiles. And we're supposed to bring salvation unto the ends of the earth to the Gentiles. They say the Gentiles rejoice. They were happy. They were glad. Huh? They were full of joy. Why? They were full of joy to hear that God wanted them. That God thought about them. That God planned to save them. Understand that before this place here in the Bible... Understand that they were foreigners and strangers, unfamiliar with the things of God, aliens away from God, distant from God. Understand, just going back to the definition of Gentile, because that definition is rooted in their relationship with God. 
not just foreign to us as a people, but foreign to God. Not just strangers to us, but strangers to God. Not just unfamiliar to us, but the Gentiles were unfamiliar to God and unfamiliar with God. Not just aliens to us, but aliens to God. They were distant from God. That's the Gentiles. So when they heard a prophet say that the Lord commanded us to bring something to you, that the Lord had set us, purposed us as a people to be a light for y'all, that the Lord had gave us a purpose to bring this gospel even to the ends of the earth for y'all. The Bible said the Gentiles was glad because for once in all of humanity's history, the Gentiles said, God loves us too. And he cares for us too. And we don't have to be Hebrew and hair like wool and feet like brass and brown skin. We don't have to be Hebrew, but God loves all the races and the nations of men because he created them all. When the Gentiles heard that, the Bible says they were glad, y'all. They rejoiced. And oh, what a proper response. What a proper response. You know when you do something for somebody that's great? You know, when you do something for somebody that you don't have to do, that, that is filled with mercy and grace, you got one group of people that take your grace and take your mercy and spit on it and step on it and, and treat you like you had to do it. But then you're going to find somebody else that you do something for, and you ain't had to do it for them. You ain't had to bless them, eh, hey God, you could have left well enough alone. You ain't had to do what you did on their behalf. All right. Now, both of them was undeserving, but you got one that when you do it, hallelujah, this one over here, he don't even, he not even grateful for it. But the other one begins to dance. Rejoice with me. They begin to, Anna, Anna. Don't make me get the mutons up in here. They going to they gonna show us how to, listen to me. Bible says that 10 lepers was here. But only one of them was grateful. The other nine, they just, oh yeah, I expect that. I deserve that. I... The Bible said the Gentiles were glad. They were glad. I turn you to Ephesians chapter 2 for a second. And we want to look at the Gentiles, just going deeper into them, Brother Carl. We want to just explore, huh? And through didactic teaching, just go back to what they were and who they were so we can understand the fullness of their excitement that the gospel was finally coming to them. That it was always purpose in God's heart to save them as well. And so in Ephesians 2, in verse 11, Paul, in his epistle to the Ephesians, now Ephesus is a Gentile city. A lot of the times we see and we read in the introduction that this thing, we take for granted that the books of the Bible are written to Hebrews. No, nah, it's written to believers. But those believers sometimes are Hebrews, but sometimes are Gentiles. And when you read these books, have an understanding of who is being written to. Because you will find Paul talking to the Hebrews, but then you'll find him talking to the Gentile believers. And so we find in Ephesians 2, he's going to be talking to the Gentiles right here. Believers, though. And he's going to remind them of something. He said, wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles, in the flesh, you was born Gentiles. He says, who are called uncircumcision. That's what Paul's saying, us Hebrews call y'all the uncircumcised. By that which is called the circumcision, the Hebrews will call the circumcision. But that was all in the flesh. That was all something that man did. It was all made by man's hands. He says, that at that time, Gentiles, remember something, remember something, you were without Christ. He's about to go into the Gentile position outside of Yahshua HaMashiach. Watch how deep this is. Paul says, outside of Christ, you were aliens 
from the commonwealth of Israel. Aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Remember, that word alien, once again, is kind of like Gentile. It means foreign, stranger, unfamiliar, distant. So the Bible says that the Gentiles were alien, watch this, from the commonwealth of Israel. What does commonwealth mean? You'll hear it sometimes when they talk about Great Britain, the commonwealth of Great Britain. England. All right, my children will get that. We say that while we're driving around. England. We just cut up like that. That's what they call the Queen's country, England, huh? The commonwealth of Great Britain. All a commonwealth is is a country. It's a nation. It's a place where citizens come together for the common good or the common wealth of their citizens. That's why it says they were aliens from the commonwealth, the nation of what? Of Israel. They were aliens from the commonwealth, from the nation of Israel. The Gentiles were distant, strangers, foreign from the Hebrew nation. You say, Pastor, what's wrong with that? Well, the Hebrew nation brought true worship to earth. Before God called us and made us a nation, there was not any true worship on earth. You might have had a few here and there, Noah and, and, and Shem, and a few here and there, but not as a nation. The Hebrews brought worship on a national level to earth. What you mean by that? Well, we had the land. We had the temple. We had the Ark of the Covenant. We had the brazen altar. We had the lampstand. We had the table of the showbread. We had the veil, hallelujah, that you couldn't get through. We had the holy place. We had the holy of holies. We had the Aaronic priesthood. We had the Levitical priesthood. We brought worship on earth, the worship of the true and living almighty most high God. That's our nation. That's our nation. So when God through Paul said they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, they were aliens, strangers, unfamiliar, and alienated from the true worship of the true and living God. You see? That's what he's saying. You see, we were the ones with the laws and the Sabbath days and the feast days and the new moon celebrations. They were alienated from that. We had all of that. And guess what? They had nothing. Now, let me just stop right there. How many people know you could have it all and not be thankful for what you got? Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah. And that's our people. We had it all. God gave it all to us. The only nation on earth who he told how to worship him right. We had it all and they had nothing. But we had it all and was ungrateful. How many people know that, hey God, sometimes you don't appreciate something until it's taken away from you? Woo! Hey, God, one child playing with a toy they don't want. Take it from them and give it to a child with no toys at all. That's what God did from the Hebrews to the Gentiles. He took what we had and said, you don't appreciate it? I'm going to give it to somebody who really going to appreciate it. The Gentiles were glad. Ooh. These Gentiles were deprived originally from the citizenship of our nation. Separated from the light, they were in the dark. We called them the heathens. We called them infidels in the scriptures, idolaters, profane, pagan, corrupt. One of the most famous words in the Bible for the Gentiles was unclean. And we were only clean because of the ceremonial laws that God gave us. He told us how to wash us. That's the only reason we was clean. But we walk around calling other people unclean. You see? What about them? They were worshiping stone, wood, silver, gold, sacrificing their children. They were doing devil worship, death worship. They were worshiping humanism, making gods out of people. Anybody hear me up in here? They were worshiping man's knowledge and man's wisdom through the Gnostics. That's the, that's the Gentiles, huh? 
Another little revelation moment. <laughs> Do you notice how in the current day we live in, they going back to what they was? Come on now, come on now. Come on, open your eyes with me. Take your eyes off your neighbor's stuff and begin to look at what's going on in the earth. Can you see how they going back? Well, they used to worship Hades. They used to worship death. They worshiping death again, man. All they want to talk about is skeletons. All they want to put on, the, all they want to wear is just death, death, death. They worshiping Hades again, baby. Ooh. They worshiping the devil again, dog. They're not coming in church no more. Listen, I'm trying to show y'all something. Look at what they're doing. They're going back to what they were. Now, the good news is we're going back to what we was as well. <laughs> Woo! Look at your neighbor and see, and ask him, can you see what God is doing? All you got to do is watch. This is what they were, and they're going back to it, all right? But God, through the grace of God during their times, he pulled them out of this, y'all. You see? But they're going back to the false gods as these dispensations switch. They're going back to it. Listen, man, they harder on you when you tell a child that Santa Claus is not real than if you told them that God wasn't real. They get more upset with you if you tell them that, the, that, that Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy is not real, then they get mad if you raise them in an atheistic home. We're going to give them their decision whether they want to serve God or not, or either, whether if there is a God or not. They're going back to paganism. They're going back to idolatry. They're going back to worshiping devils and demons and stone and wood and clay and silver and gold. In Hebrews, hey, God, if you part of the remnant, you go, as they feel what they were calling them, we are going to hear and feel what we were calling us. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. But, but Joseph Gray, it's not all of us that's going to hear that. Because some of y'all got a lot of gentle in y'all. Oh, well, let me just, let me just. Yee! Which part of your bloodline you going to listen to? Let's keep going, let's keep going, let's keep going. They were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Huh? They were also, hallelujah, aliens. Watch this. They were strangers to the covenants of promise. This means that they had no covenants or promise from God. That's the Gentiles. Huh? They were without knowledge and without a share in the covenants of promise. When we were people, we had the Abrahamic covenant. We had the Davidic covenant. We had the Noahic covenant. We had covenants with God. We had promises from God. You know how it is when you got a promise from God? It means that you got something to hang your hat on. It means that, hey, God, when everything is low and nothing seems like it's going to break, I got a word from God that says I'm the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, that he's going to provide for me, that he's going to heal me. It's nothing like having a promise. Huh? Huh? This word is a promise from God. Some of y'all value in the promise of people in your family more than you promise in the promises of God. You see? See, when we do a closing, we sign what's called a promissory note. And that promissory note is a promise to pay. And when people sign that promissory note, the bank will give you anything you want because you done promised them that you was going to pay this right here. The bank believes your word. Huh? Huh? I'm telling you that God done sign a promissory note to you. He told you that he was going to pay you. He was going to bless you. He was going to keep you. He was going to heal you. It seemed like the banks got more faith than the people of God. They're more excited about your promise than you are about God's promise. Oh my God, my God. You see, these Gentiles were outside of the promises and the covenants. 
But when Paul began to preach to them this gospel, that through the cross of Yahshua HaMashiach, they would be adopted into the beloved. Instead of being a separate people, they would be brought into the covenants and the promises of Abraham. Just read Galatians and read the book of Romans. They were engrafted into the tree of Israel. And they understood that. And it's something else, a eh, God, when you understand that you don't have no promises, but when Paul is speaking to you, God changes all of that, and now all the promises you wish you had, now you got them. It would be like you born in a poor family, but you'd have to watch this rich family pass your neighborhood every single day. And they driving anything they want, they, they wearing anything they want, and, and you see the children up in there. They fed, they clean, they cut. Hey, God, they got nice clothes. Hey, God, and you watch them close, because when you see them in the park, you see them come out, and they say, Daddy, Mama, can we have a snow cone? And, and Mom and Daddy say, yeah, we got promises that we was going to provide for you. We're going to get you a snow cone. Mom and Dad, can we have a hot dog, 100% beef hot dog there? Yeah, we're going to get you a hot dog. Amen. We're going to hallelujah. We're going to get you. Why? Because we promised some things. We're your parents and parents. Good parents always take care of their children. And, and so, so here you are, you poverty stricken. You dirty. You the exact opposite of this family over here that you see riding around and is in the parks. And you watching the dad and the mama fulfill their obligations and their promises. And you watching yours. You don't have none. There ain't no promises being kept to you. But some kind of way when you was on the outside, you was a stranger. That daddy and that mama come to you and say, look, little boy, we've been watching you. You ain't got no promises, you ain't got no covenant, you ain't got nobody to love you, nobody taking care of you, you're dirty, your hair not combed, you're malnourished, amen. What we gonna do for you, we gonna take you in and bring you into these promises and bring you into these covenants. And the way that we took care of them, we gonna take care of you. We gonna adopt you into the beloved. Anybody hear me up in here? When the Gentiles heard it, they were glad. Anybody hear me up in here? The same way would we would be glad. If on a tiny level that would happen, that's what happened to the Gentile races of men. God adopted them into the family of God. And originally, Paul is telling them, he's reminding them, listen, listen, that's not the way you were. Remember, you were aliens to the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenants and the promise. Now watch, he keeps going. He says, you had, he said, he said, he said you had no hope. No hope. When the Bible talk about the Gentiles, they say sometimes the Gentiles would say, let us eat and drink and be merry because tomorrow we die. No hope of everlasting life. No hope of living with God. No hope of heaven. No hope like we have that one day we're going to walk them streets of gold. We're going to open up them pearly gates. Hallelujah. We're going to be there with our God with no more sickness and no more disease and no more pain. They got no more knee hurting you. No more back aches. No more bulging and herniated This Ain't going to be no headaches and no migraine. Ain't going to have to worry about no coronavirus. The devil ain't going to be there. No more temptation. No more drugs and no more alcohol. They got. That's what it is when you you got a hope. Anybody hear me up in here? That's when you have a hope. These Gentiles had no hope. No hope. And hope come from promises. Hope come from covenants. They had no covenants. They had no promises. So they had no hope. The situation they were in, they were just in it. They couldn't call to God. They didn't know God. When Paul was preaching in Athens at Areopagus, he saw one of their poets write a poem. The beginning of the poem was, unto the unknown God. That's how they called him. Because they were far from him, distant from him. When he walked with us, walk our streets, heal our diseases, <laughs> fed our multitude with fish and loaves. They say, unto the unknown God. And when you read that in Acts, Paul say, yeah, hey, God, he was unknown. But Gentiles understand something. He doing the new thing in the earth and the God that you say was unknown is about to be known to you. For he had made out of one blood all the nations of men. And the times of ignorance he, that he used to wink upon, he is not winking upon that anymore. He has a provided a way of salvation through the man, Yahshua HaMashiach 
who died for your sins and was raised from the grave on the third day. Now you who was far off can be brought nigh. Give God some glory up in this house. This is the Gentiles. They had no hope and were without God in the world. You see? Now we Hebrews. But if we had to take this on an individual level, we know how it is to be without God. We know how it was before God saved us. Since we were in our diaspora, the funny thing is, <laughs> we were the Hebrews, but we thought that we were the Gentiles. And he saved us from all kind of madness that we was a part of. And now we got all of these promises. So when we say that the Gentiles was glad, I got a question for you. How glad were you when God saved you? <laughs> when you realized that this word was a love letter to you. How glad were you when he took you out the club and took you off the drug and took you off the drink? Anybody hear me up in here? How glad were you when he changed your life? You see? When he took you from darkness, that's right, Brother Carl, when he took you from darkness and brought you into his marvelous life, how glad were you? I know how glad I was. When I got saved, hey God, I couldn't even sit down. I was like, oh, my God, what done happened to me? I've been forgiven. Woo! I've been set free. My God, my God, I've been picked up from the side of the road, the back alley, the trash can. I was lying in my own blood. He walked by me, saw me in my blood, and he said unto me, live. Hey, God, I was excited. I was glad. Woo! That's what it was about. That's when you see and understand the text that we have. They were glad when they heard Paul say this. They were glad. It is God that loved them, not turn his back upon them, and giving them a gospel, a God, whereby they can be saved. As we look at our B part of the scripture, and the Bible continues, they were not only glad, and when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, and what else? And they glorified the word of the Lord. Oh, my God, my God, my God. I tell you what, them Gentiles make us look bad when they get God. Oh, they were glad. And what else they did? They glorified the word of the Lord. My God, my God, my God, my God. Let's break this down a little bit more. Let's parse it up. Let's parse it up. All right. When we talk about hallelujah, that word glorify, hmm, what does that mean? The word glorify means to esteem something. Huh? It means to honor something. Huh? It means to magnify something. It means to praise the most high for something. Woo, you know, if you just read over that glorify, you're going to miss a whole bunch of stuff. Hey, God, that's why we just got to break it down. Somebody say break it down, Pastor. Break it down. I'm going to try my best to break. I'm going to break. Somebody say break it down, Pastor. Yeah, I'm going to try my best to break it down. With the Lord's help, we're going to break it down. Yeah, 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 yeah. You broke it down in the club. Let's break it down in the church. Come on, do it with me. Let's break it down. Let's break it down. Come on, come on. It's your own, brother, Duck. Let's break it down. Let's break it down. Miss Chantel, you can't break it down. Break it down, Miss Chantel. That's not how Duck told me you used to break it down. Break it down, somebody. John, you got a little breakdown left in you? Come on. Yeah. Let's break it down a little bit. Let's break. For a lady, I ain't asking you to break nothing down. <laughs> all right, all right, come on. Come on, here we go. What does glorify mean? Just want to make sure y'all paying attention. Y'all up. Y'all still up? Yeah. What does glorify mean? All right? It means to esteem, to honor, to magnify, to praise, to extol, and to celebrate. This is how the Gentiles felt about the word of God. This is how they felt when they heard it, when they got it. Let's break it down. First thing it means is to esteem. When you esteem something, you respect it. You respect it. 
you admire it. You know, when you respect something, you don't treat it no any old kind of way. They esteem the word of God to hold it in high regard. You know? Sometimes we be at the house and we clean it up and I grab first lady Bible. I'm about to put it on the floor. She's, oh, oh, oh. don't put my Bible on the floor. Don't put my Bible on the floor. I'm like, baby, the word is in the Bible. It's, <laughs> I still don't want my Bible on the floor. Somebody say esteem the word of God. <laughs> I'm lying. That's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, better not put it. Give me your Bible now. Let me see it. All right, all right, all right, all right. So they esteem the word. And it's not just the book, no, but, but the hearing of it, the teaching of it, the reading of it, to, to respect it. You see, not only that, that glorify means not only to esteem, but to honor the word, you know? You know what it means when you honor something, you know? You know, when the judge would walk in, they say what? All oh, rise. Oh ye, oh ye, oh ye, God save the court, the court, the judge. And the city of Lafayette. <laughs> and you stand in honor. You see, when you honor something, Aegon, is 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 you show respect, but 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 oh God help me. Honor means that you feel like it's a privilege. It's a privilege. The Gentiles got this word, and they not only respected it, but they honored it. They felt like, I shouldn't even be hearing what I'm hearing. I shouldn't even have the, op I know where I come from. I shouldn't even be able to read this, understand this. This letter from the most high God should not even be in my hand and written to me. I don't deserve this. It's a privilege for me to be here. That's what the Gentiles felt. They glorified it. Why? Because they esteemed it. They honored it. It was a privilege. Well, look, 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 look what they did. They magnified it. Huh? What does that mean, Pastor? Well, when you magnify something, that means you focus in on it. They focus in on this word. Some of y'all focus on a lot of stuff, but you ain't magnifying the word. You ain't focus in on the word. See, back in the days, amen, Hallelujah, when they used to have the magnifying glasses, huh? I'd go outside. Now, nah, nah, that was before I used to burn them with the sun, but, but I'd go outside. And I'd look at the little roly poly. You understand what I'm saying? And you could see all the little, the little, the little legs. And underneath, look like they had two eyes and the antennas and... And then I'd move from the rolling pullers to the black ants. I won't see them black ants. And that was before I would take the two ants and make them fight each other. But that's all right. I wasn't redeemed just yet. I didn't know that black on black wasn't right. But you see what I'm saying? I, I'm redeemed now. But, but I used to magnify. You see, when you magnify something, you focus in. You pay attention to every single detail. You value every word, every period, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. The Gentiles, y'all, not only esteemed the word, not only honored the word, but they magnified the word. I got to see what God is saying here. What does he mean by this comma right here? By this took him down from the tree right here. What does he mean? They magnified the word. And magnify is not only a magnifying glass, but it's also a microscope. Huh? Because sometimes you want to not only magnify something to see in detail. No, you want to go to a microscopic level and see what's in it. Oh, God, have mercy. Hey, God, you not only want to read the word and pay attention. No, you want to study to show yourself approved. A workman that needed not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of God. You want to go back to the concordance and look at the Greek and look at the Hebrew and look at what tense is written in. Hey, God, we want to magnify the word. Come on and let's magnify the word together. This is what the Gentiles did. Hebrews, listen. When it was their time. When it was their season, when God was calling them unto himself, 
They were glad. And they glorified the word. They esteemed it. They honored it. They magnified it, focused on it, and not the trivialities of church. I'm going to leave that right there. Somebody say self-control, Pastor. Listen, 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 listen. Microscope, telescope, camera, they zoom in to enhance, to enlarge, to amplify. You see? That word glorify means they praised. They was in that word and they heard it. They began to praise God for that word. They would get a nugget, get a revelation from Paul, a God, and they would break out with a hallelujah. You know, sometimes you'll be in church and you get a word and you're waiting on a word. You're like, God, what do I do in this situation? But then you, David say, hey, God, he felt a certain way. But the Bible say, until I went unto the house of the Lord, then I understood that. And you know, when you get a word from the Lord, sometimes we sit in here and we get a word and we don't say nothing. The Gentiles, when they got a word, they made God know that they were grateful for the word they got. They say, hallelujah. They praised him. For the word. And, and pay attention to the word hallelujah because that word praise right here, hallelujah, is, is one level. But that next word extol, somebody say extol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't use that word no more. And don't name your little boy that. Well, that might not be that bad. We can call him X for short. <laughs> extol. Praise. Admiration. Honor. Exaltation. Extol. You see, the Gentiles got the word and they praise God, but, but they want to clarify something right here. See, because a lot of good things happen to you and you praise a lot of things. Extol means not just to praise. It means the highest praise. <laughs> Somebody say a high praise. The Gentiles made sure they worship other things before Christ. But when they got this gospel from the Most High, when it was their season and their time, they gave God a different kind of praise. They made sure that they praised him more than they praised the idols. They gave him high praise. They gave him the highest praise. Some of y'all Hebrews was happier in the club than you're happy in church. Some of y'all was happier lost than you all found, if you really all found. But, but, but some of y'all, some of y'all serve the devil way harder than you done serve God. You're not giving God the high praise. You're not extolling him. You see, I had made a deal with God because I had served the devil hard. Oh, yeah, Duck was there too. He served him hard too. Got a bunch of them that was up in there. Where Anthony at? He done served the devil real hard. What you laughing for, Kip? <laughs> All right, great. Don't start us. See, when you begin to glorify God and you know that you privileged to be in the house of God and privileged to be getting the word of God and it's an honor and, and you know where you come from and you, you never should have made it and now you got these promises and these covenants and you ain't had nothing before. Your, your own mama and daddy didn't like you, but God done came and been a father to the fatherless and a mother to the motherless. And when my mother and my father forsake me, the Lord done took me up. Listen, 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 listen. When you got that testimony, Miss Mary, you know what I'm talking about. You look at God and you say, God, I done served the devil hard. I done dance for the devil. I done sung for the devil. I done, I done preach and teach for the devil. I done... So when you save me, God, I make a deal with you. I'm not just going to praise you. I'm going to extol you. I'm going to give you the highest praise. I'm going to, There's not a place I won't go for you. There's not a person I won't talk on your behalf about. My God, I'll give you the highest praise. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, extol the Lord. Yeah, yeah, you got to give him the highest. You got to give him the highest. Some of y'all are more happier. You was more happy in the world than you are in church. You was, 
you was more grateful in the world than you were in church. You were, if you really save, I'm saying. It seemed like if I had to choose, I'd be like, give me the unsave you. Because the save you bring in more trouble. If you really save. You see, when we extol the Lord, we bring him the highest, man. With all my strength. All my might. All my mind. Ooh, I'm going to love you, God. <laughs> and so when the worship team come out and say dance, I'm not going to be ashamed. Of dancing because when I was in Copa, I wasn't ashamed to dance, and when I was in Strawberries, I wasn't ashamed of dancing. But I sit up in my seat, and when it's time to dance for the Lord who done saved my soul, now I want to play shy. You wouldn't shy when you were dropping it, you wouldn't shy when you were, you wouldn't shy then. Why you gonna be shy now? Yeah, Dr. Boogie asked you to dance, you were dancing. Troy D asked you to dance, you were dancing. Now Yahshua HaMashiach asked you to dance. You're not giving him your highest. You got to give him the highest praise. He can't look back on your life and see areas where you was more thankful for darkness where you was more thankful for ignorance, when you was more thankful for sin. You see what I'm saying? Leah, what's that part in the song when you, when you were saying, you, it was something about dance. You was... Ooh. Come on, just do that part again. I will sing hallelujah. I will sing hallelujah until you come again. You see that part when we say, I'm going to dance in your presence, I'm going to dance. And we'll dance in your presence until you come again. Come on, just move your hands like that. Just a little dance, just a little dance. Come on. I will sing hallelujah Tell you. until you come again. You wouldn't shame in the club. You wouldn't shame at the game. And we'll dance in your presence. I'm going to dance in your presence. You I'm going to give you the highest praise. Come on, you were more excited at the game last week. I will sing hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Hey. Come again. Hey, hallelujah, God. I'm going to dance. And we'll dance in your presence. Hey. Until you come again. Come on, give God some glory. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the Gentiles, when it was their time, they understood what it meant to extol the Lord. You're not going to catch me, them Gentiles, see. Serving Baal, Ashtoreth, Tamas, and doing that harder than, I was serve, than I'm serving the Lord. No. He deserves the highest praise. Come on, give y'all some glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They extolled the Lord. They celebrated the Lord. You see what I'm saying? And, and just stay with me a little while longer. You see what I'm saying? And as we look at Ephesians 2 again, you see, I just want to just break that down. You see, that's their story. And Paul was telling, he told him, he says, listen, but now in Christ Jesus, Gentiles, understand, you who sometimes were far off. Somebody say far off. far off. That's what he told the Gentiles. You was far off. You are now made nigh by the blood of Christ. See, it's the cross. It's the cross. It's the cross that saved the Gentiles. All right? And that's why they was glad. That's why they glorified the word of the Lord. That same cross that saved us. Huh? It saves them. And look at it. He says, for he, that's Yahshua Jesus, is our peace. All right? You see, before the cross, we were in enmity with God. Our sins had separated us from God. 
But the Bible says that, hallelujah, the cross brings us peace. That's why Yahshua is called the Prince of Peace. Because he made peace between a holy God and a sinful people. And that peace should not have been made. Because sin and holiness don't mix. For God can't even look upon iniquity. But some kind of way, it got Yahshua made peace. And he made peace through his sacrifice on the cross. But he not only made peace between God and man. On earth, there were two groups of men. There were Hebrews, Israel, the commonwealth, the one who knew how to worship God. And there was another group, Gentiles. And I know we separated, we Puerto Rican, Chinese, they're not, it's only two groups. Hebrews and Gentiles. Yahshua not only made peace between God and man, he took the two groups that were separate. <laughs> For he is our peace who had made both groups one. Yeah. When we understand this cross as we should understand it, God do a new thing. It's a new covenant huh? where he take the two groups and he make it one. That's what I've been saying in Romans. He, he, he took the tree of Israel and he engrafted the Gentiles into the tree. All right, all right, all right. He had broken down the middle wall of partition between us, between Hebrews and Gentiles, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of the commandments. He abolished the law, huh? In the ordinance, for to make himself of twain, to make for himself, God made for himself out of two. Watch this. One new Man, one new nation, so making peace, and that he might reconcile, all right, both the Gentiles and the Hebrews, reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. We got a lot of Hebrews confused. They think that salvation is one way for the Gentiles and another way for the Hebrews. That the Gentiles get saved through the cross, but we get saved by keeping the law. The devil is a liar. You understand what I'm saying? By means of salvation, y'all, he had reconciled both groups unto God in one body. By what? By the cross. Having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached peace to you, Gentiles, which were afar off, and preached peace to them, that were not the Hebrews. <laughs> For through him, Yahshua, we both, the Jews, Hebrews, and the Gentiles, have access by one spirit unto the Father. The cross is good for all people. You hear what I'm talking about? I have never told you that salvation was different. I've never told you that you determined you a Hebrew so you could somehow be saved some kind of other way. Listen, you being a Hebrew is not theology, it's identity. The theology don't change. The gospel don't change. The soteriology does not change. Just the identity changes. And the identity is important not for soteriology, not for salvation. We save all the same way. The identity is only important for eschatology, for the end of days, because we have a purpose to play. We save the same way, but we have a purpose to play in the in the days. Do you know your purpose that you're going to have to play in these in the days? I'm trying to make it clear for you right now. This has always been what we taught. We ain't never taught nothing else. I told you, if you don't accept this cross, you'll just be a Hebrew in hell. And there will be plenty of Hebrews in hell. That's what Jesus told him. He said, oh, yeah, in the next line, it's going to be Gentile strangers in paradise with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob while the children of the kingdom are cast out. It's not about you being proud I'm a Hebrew. 
It's about you being a Hebrew and getting what God is doing in these last days. That's what it's about. So for the Gentiles, he tell them in Ephesians 2, now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Mr. Nice, these strangers, these foreigners, look, the rich family passed by and opened the door and said, get in. And the way that I took care of my kids, I'm going to take care of you. But what we find in this is that the kids in the rich man's car not grateful. But the child that they picked up who was homeless, who didn't have a mom and a daddy and no hope in the world, are more grateful than the biological seed of the one that's driving the Bentley, the Maserati, the, the whatever other car y'all like to say, huh? We find in that the Gentiles, they were more glad. They glorified the word more than the Hebrews who had it the whole time. You see? They glorified the word of God. They esteemed it. They honored it. They magnified it. They praised God for it. They extolled it. They, they celebrated it. Why? Because God had not forgotten them. That God kept, a God, his mind on them. He had a plan for them. Now, Hebrews, listen. In these last days, I'm not done yet, but in these last days, <laughs> all right? Because I felt that in the spirit. Oh, you want it now? I ain't want it now. <laughs> no, we're going we gonna to cover point C. Oh, yeah, we working, baby. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so me and Brian were spending some time, amen, last night, and, and we was talking, and or rather, it might have been when we was on the phone and Brian asked me, he said, he said, Pastor, he said, he said, if you had to describe Atlanta, what would you say? I said, Brian, I said, the thing about Atlanta is, is that they, they love the word of God. They feel it's a privilege that they're getting to hear this. I see my children watching people cry under the word. Grown men that can barely stand in my arms while I'm. You see, I, and I told him, I said, the difference about Atlanta is, is that they esteeming. They honoring. They magnifying. They praising God for. They extolling. And they celebrating. The word of the Lord. That's the greatest difference. And in Philly, we have pockets of that. But as a church, we're not there no more. You see, as we move to this season of the Hebrews, we got to do better than the Gentiles did when they, it was their season. <laughs> They was glad. They, 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 they celebrated. They, they was God the privilege to think about us. God, why can't we have the same heart? Pastor, you say, why? Well, because we, we crucified him. We, we turned our backs on him. We, we forgot him and we did all man of wickedness. I'm going to be preaching of hermit theology in Atlanta this Wednesday about all the sins that Israel did, running down all the kings, running down all of our iniquities. We, we did so much to God. And we were the rich kids in the car. We did so much to him. And for him, after all of our wrong, to turn back and say, while the Gentiles are glad, while the Gentiles celebrate, and we didn't have the right response, for a good and gracious God to turn back, you didn't do the right thing, but I still ain't forgot about you. I'm not going to leave you in bondage, and I'm not going to leave you a slave. I hadn't forgotten about you. We should be glad. We should be glad. We should be glad. And we should glorify the word of the Lord. 
But the problem with the Hebrews has been a great problem. It's been a problem since our very beginning. The problem is, is that we don't know when it's our season. We got a problem telling time. The Bible says quickly in Jeremiah 8, 7, it says even the stark, even the stark know her appointed times. Even the turtle and the crane <laughs> and the swallow, they all know their times. They flying south when it's time to fly south. They making nests when it's time to make nests. All the creation knows its times. God says, but my people, my people, my people know not. You don't know your times. And because you don't know your times, God will judge you. Because you're in the wrong time. You're in the wrong season. You're not where you're supposed to be, so he judged you. But our problem is twofold. We don't know our time, and when he judges us to get us in the right place, we don't even know when we're being judged. You're not only not, you're, you're not, excuse the double and triple negative, you not only don't know your time, but you don't know when God is judging you to move you to get in position for your time. Look what he say in Matthew 16, 2, 3. He answered and said unto them, when it is evening, you say it is fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Oh, ye hypocrites, you could discern the face of the sky, my people, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. You don't know your times. You don't know your times. Look at your neighbor and ask him, what time is it? Look at your other neighbor and ask him, ask him you got a digital clock? time it is. Got a sight pop. You can't see, you can't hear. You can't see and hear in your own life. And here you are trying to see and hear for a nation. You can't see and hear for your own life. You turning the wrong way, going the wrong way in your own personal life. And here you are judging the times and seasons of a nation. You don't even know your own times. You don't even know your own times. He said the Hebrews, he said, you can't discern the signs of the times. Look at Luke 19. Come on, we're not, we not done yet. Oh, no, baby, I got to give you something. I got to give you something. Luke 19. And when he was come near, he beheld the city. Our city, first lady. And he wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, it's your day. The Messiah is here. The Savior you was waiting on. If you would have known, even you, Israel, at least in this day, the things which belong, they got some things that belong unto you, the things that belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee, referring to Titus, Roman siege of Jerusalem before our diaspora. And he says, and they shall lay thee even with the ground. Let me, let me, let me a trench about thee, encompass thee round, and keep thee in every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. Why? Why did we get judged? Why did we get kicked out of Jerusalem and move and migrate to West Africa, Negro land, to Ghana? Why did all that happen? Why did all that happen and end up on some ships and end up in the transatlantic slave trade in Brazil, end up in Europe and end up in America? Why did all of that happen? Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. You don't know your time. The Gentiles were glad. They glorified the word of the Lord. But you didn't know your time. I'm going to give you a couple more. Matthew 23, 37. That's the city for his lady. 
O Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. <laughs> we ain't going to do point C today. I can feel it already. Kip, look what he said about us. When it's our season, Malibu, look what we do. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, look what we do when it's our season. Thou that killest the prophets. Look what else we do. And stonest them which are sent unto thee. This is how we treat our prophets. When it's our season in the past, we killed our prophets and we stoned them. We either took their life or we hurt them or we harmed them or we slandered them or we gossip about them or we talk about them or we just... The, the Gentiles celebrated Amisha. They were glad. They glorified. They say, what a privilege to hear it. We kill the ones that bring it. We kill the ones who bring it. We stone the ones who bring it. Look at all of our prophets. Elijah pretty much was suicidal by the time he was done with them. I was about to say it first later. By the time he was done with them Negroes, he was, he was suicidal. He said, Lord, take me now. And, and you tripping about if we the people or not. You got a vision problem. If you can't see we them, we them people, you, you is blind. But you probably lost. But listen to me, listen to me. He's saying two things. We killed the prophets. We stoned them which are sent to us. Look what Yahshua said. How often would I have gathered, the, gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings? Jesus said, my heart was always to gather you in, to bring you close, to have you under the safety of my wings, Ooh, to rest, to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Anybody hear me up in here? Jesus said, I often I would have done it to you when it was your season because I wanted you. Come on, it's your season. Come on, hurry up. It's your season. He said, and ye would not. He said, behold, because you don't know it's your season, your house is left unto you desolate. When you don't know it's your season, God judges Desolation. He did it, a God, uh, through the Titus, General Titus, and, uh, and the Romans, a God, and I believe he's going to do it again because there's going to be a bunch of Hebrews who don't know it's our season. But I believe that there's going to be a remnant who understand, who know we're going to move with God. But I declare, I declare desolation and judgment on all the Hebrews who don't know this their time. What the Bible says, when you don't know as you see, your house is left unto you desolate. When you don't know it's your season. You see? Look what Jesus said. I told him about this in Atlanta. He said, For I say unto you, you shall not see me. Henceforth, that's somebody that's upset. <laughs> I came to get you, and you wasn't there. Or I came to get you to bless you, and you're peeking through the blind. I know you're there, the blind moving. <laughs> but I'm looking through the little cracks in the blind. And why the blind going like that? And the air conditioner not running on the side of your house. 
God come for us and we never open up to him. We look through the blind, now the Gentile children all in the car, and God saying, come on, the children of my blood, the children that I raised. I'm ready. We got to leave. We got to get out. The Gentiles are with me. They're glad. They're celebrating. They're esteeming. They're honoring. They're glorifying. How often I would have gathered you, but you would not. You would not. He leaving. He getting his car. Put his seatbelt on. Die on the cross. Buried in the grave. Rose the third day. Spent 40 days in the land of the living. Stepped on a cloud, ascended on high. Went up to the gates of heaven. Who is this king of glory, the Lord, strong and mighty? Open up ye heavenly gates and let the king of glory come in. Daniel says, then I beheld one like the son of man coming on a cloud before the ancient of days. And when he approached the ancient of days was given unto him dominion and honor and majesty. Hey God, and a dominion that would never end. And the Bible says that Stephen, when he was stoned, he said, behold, I see Jesus. Standing on the right side of majesty. He's seated on the right hand of glory even now. He left us, packed up, drove off. We didn't want nothing to do with him. And he tells us this morning, he says, I say unto you, Israel, you shall not see me henceforth. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. Until. He left us. Should not be passing back, but he's a good God. He's a good God. Has he cast away Israel forever? God forbid. He left. Huh? Went right around the corner. You're not going to see me henceforth again until God waiting for us to do something. Oh, God, they say it don't matter, you the Hebrews. But he's not going to return until the Hebrews do something. The world waiting for Yahshua to come back, but he won't come back until the Hebrews do something. But they say it don't matter whether you're the Hebrews or not. No, that's the devil, because the devil don't want him to come back. He's not going to come back until, until his people do something. And if his people don't do it, he ain't coming. And that's why the devil did a work, boy. Made you forget who you was, stopped you from reading, stopped you from reading the Bible. Did, he did a work, y'all, an ingenious, brilliant, wicked work. Because he know that Yahshua ain't coming back for his people until, until, until. You want to know why it's so important you know it's you, the people? Because God waiting for something to come out of your mouth. Yeah. He going to pass back in front of the house. And the one that had the blind closed, he wants you to raise the blind up. He wants you to open up the windows. Hey, God. And he wants you to say something. He wants you to say something. Now, I'm going to put it in our original language so you could know what y'all want to hear from us. He want to hear Baruch. Baruch. Haba. Bashem Adonai or Yahweh. You know what I'm saying? It, they, some say Yahweh, but I'm a, some say Adonai, but I'm going to say Yahweh. The original that is written in our New Testament is Baruch, Haba, Bashem, Adonai, but I kind of like the Yahweh better. Baruch, Haba, Bashem, Yahweh. Baruch, Haba, Bashem, Yahweh. See, he came for us. He sent his prophets for us. He sent his men and women of God for us. We kill him, we stone him, we crucify him, and he say, I'm not coming back. I'm not coming back till you ready. I'm not coming back until you say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. When your heart change, 
when your heart changed as a people towards God and towards his prophets and towards his love for you. He said, I ain't come back till you do that. And what I have right here is just the Hebrew of it. Baruch, Haba, Bashem, Yahweh. Can you say that with me again? Baruch, Haba, Bashem, Yahweh. All we're saying is blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We're not going to kill him no more. We're not going to stone him no more. God, we love you. We're glad for your word. We glorify your word. We count it a privilege that you would even make the block and pass back for us. Baruch Haba Bashem Yahweh. In your prayer time alone with him, take a picture of that. Say it to him. He will not return until his people say it. He will not return until his work within our hearts. And the funny thing about your mouth and your heart, sometimes you got to say things over and over again until it get to your heart, until it get in your heart. Huh? Hey, God, that's why we meditate on the word day and night so it can go from our mouth and our mind to our heart. We got to do that, y'all. Write it down. Take a picture of it. Baruch Haba Bashem Yahweh. That's what we got to say. Last scripture. And then we're going to go. You say, Pastor, you sure about that? You sure that Yahweh will not return until his people have a revelation? Until they, until they get right with him? Until, they, until, they, until their hearts get right? Oh, yes, I'm sure. I'm sure that's why eschatology is important in regards to our identity. It does matter. Through salvation, it doesn't. It, we, we lumped up into one in regards to salvation, but in regards to his return, God is waiting for his people to be ready. We go back to Hosea. Hosea chapter 5, an old prophet by the name of Hosea. And God is talking to us. He says, in Hosea 5, for I will be unto Ephraim as a lion and as a young lion to the house of Judah. God says, I, even I, will tear and go away. I will take away and none shall rescue him. God is talking about his judgment. He's going to put upon our people for not knowing our times and our seasons. That's the, that's the season that we are in and leaving out of. He judged us, all right? Well, watch this. God says, after he judges us, in Hosea 5 and 15, he says, after I judge you, I will go and return to my place. What's God's place? Heaven. Where Jesus at? In heaven. He's seated on the right hand of who? God the Father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He came. We crucified him. He left. He went to his place. He said, I'm going to go and I'm going to return unto my place. How long are you going to return unto your place, God, after you judge us for all that we've done? Tell they acknowledge their offense. Yeah. Tell his people. He's talking about Ephraim and Judah. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to go away, and, I, and I'm not returning back until they acknowledge their offense. And two, and seek my face. I'm going to return to my place and tell that. See, the devil don't want you to know what I'm telling you right now. Because when God's people begin to call on God, he can't help but to answer. It wasn't until they began to, hallelujah, sigh in the presence of the Lord while they was in Egypt that God began to move and set them free from Egyptian bondage. He said, listen, you're going to have to acknowledge your offense. And seek my face. And he says this, in their affliction, they will seek me early. God is saying that in this time, it's going to be a remnant that's going to start seeking him. All right? Last scripture, Hosea 6, and we winding down. This is what we are, to, are supposed to say. Come and let us return unto the Lord. For he has torn and he will heal us. He had smitten, and he will bind us or, 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 or wrap up our wounds, huh? After two days, will he revive us? And the third day, 
he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Three, then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. Saints of God, I bring before you the way the Gentiles responded to their season. They were glad. They glorified the word of the Lord. And my prayer is that the remnant of Israel would see this second season that we in and get happy that God never left us behind, that he ain't never forgot about us and begin to honor his word again, that we would not do like our first visitation. Stone the prophets, kill the prophets, and kill the Messiah. And that we would understand that God is waiting on us, his people, to acknowledge our offense and to say, Baruch, Haba, Bashim, Yahweh. Let's give God some glory up in this house. <laughs> Hallelujah. Most high God, we thank you so much, God, for this time in the word. We are happy that you're still speaking to your people, and we pray that your people would be happy as well. Now, God, we have gone over this gospel throughout this message. We've talked about what you've done on the cross, and the resurrection, and we know, God, that we are sinners, and our prayer is that you would save those who are lost amongst us. Ushers, if you can open up the gates, the altar is going to be open right here. If you want to make sure that you're saved, hey God, if you want to acknowledge to God our guilt as a people of, of, of not knowing our times and our seasons, if, if you need to repent or anything else at this altar, come, we'll spend a little bit of time at the altar and then we're going to go the Bible tells us salvation is as easy as ABC. We admit that we're sinners, which we all are. We believe in Yahshua HaMashiach. Hallelujah. And the Bible says we confess him as our Lord and King. And the Bible says whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you hear and you feel a tug on your spirit, go ahead and come. Go ahead and come. Go ahead and come to this altar. Go ahead and come. Hallelujah. 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 Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Hey! That's what he wanted people to say. That's the heart that God wants us to have. That's what he's waiting on. He wants his people to want to be with him again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey. We want to be with you, God. Just want to be. pray and I'm praying that after we pray they sing a little more even starting with that yes the world hey God and but I want to pray with you and I want to ask God to do something great amongst us so if you're here just just repeat after me say Yahweh thank you coming back for us we admit as a people and individually we are sinners but we believe that you died on the cross you were buried in the grave 
And on the third day, you rose. Now, Lord, Baruch, Haba, Bashem, Yahweh, Baruch, Haba, Bashem, Yahweh, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. We will not fight you anymore. We will not kill your prophets anymore. We will not stone your people anymore. Help us to know our season and use me for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, give y'all some praise. Come on, give him some praise. Come on, praise him. Praise him. Hallelujah. Hey, God. Yes, 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 yes. Every, every. Hallelujah. 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 King of glory. Woo. Just one. 